Hey, hey, everybody, Z Garcia here, and welcome back to Board Game Blender. Today, we're going to be talking about games that make us feel empowered, whether that is because they, they set us in the role of a hero or because we feel we are represented in those games. You're going to hear a little bit about both of those, okay? Uh, you know, games that have now gotten to the point that you can find yourself, whoever you are, represented in different board games out there, whatever the reason may be. And games that, you know, set you as a uh, someone who is you feel good playing as. That's not to say that it isn't fun to pretend to roleplay as the villain of a story, as a fantastical creation in a tale that the game is telling and involving you in. But there is a certain charm and uh, attraction to being the good person, you know? To, to, to winning the day. And so we're going to talk about that today. You're going to hear a little bit of, of both of those concepts when it comes to feeling empowered. So I hope you enjoy the episode. As always, uh, feel free to watch this in whatever order you want to. Enjoy it. Consume it. I hope you find some cool new games that maybe you're not aware of. And I'm going to see you in just a little bit. Hey everyone, my name is Chris, and this is the Teacher's Lounge. Now if you're like me, your two-year-old daughter has her own stuffed toy pathogen. Kinda cool, isn't it? But also if you're like me, you probably very frequently teach games to your group of friends and family. So the Teacher's Lounge is a segment where we talk about teaching recommendations. So why am I holding this, this toy pathogen probably covered in lots of real pathogens from my daughter? Well that's because we're talking about empowering role models that are good for good for all of us. So today's game is this, Pandemic The Cure, a dice-based version of the original Pandemic, still designed by Matt Leacock. I really like this one because dice control the player actions as well as the disease cubes determining where they go out. It's a little bit quicker than the original and it's a little bit luckier but it's still just as fun, I think, and plays, like I said, a little bit faster. And I like teaching this one. Part of the reason I like it is because the player's unique characters are a little more distinct because their dice are all different. So my recommendation when you teach this game, however, is to teach the things that are consistent for all characters before you go into what's unique for each one. Now this would apply to many cooperative and competitive games where each player will have a unique player power. Uh, and so on a given turn, you'll roll your dice and you can do things like move and treat, uh, treat diseases by putting them here into the middle or by spending your treats to take them out of the middle and put them back in the dice bag, removing them from the immediate threat. You can also use bottles like this to grab uh, to grab diseases that are in the middle so that you can try and roll for a cure later on. These are die faces that are common amongst every character in the game. Then, after you've taught all of those ideas, then is when I would go into what makes each character special. The scientist, for example, uh, the, the white pawn, gets a plus two to her roll when she tries to roll for a cure for a disease. The Contingency Planner has a die face that is completely unique only to his uh, bluish teal colored dice. And so the same thing with the Contingency Planner who can remove a bunch of the dice from this middle pool here and get them out. And the Dispatcher here, for example, also has a unique die face which is a helicopter ability. Also, the Dispatcher has some unique different powers. So for example, if, if, uh, if the Dispatcher moves, from one continent to another, he can also drag one of the players with him. And so those are cool things, but you want to teach those after you've taught the general, normal, shared actions that everybody has, because then it'll make it more clear, it'll make it easier to grasp once you have a better idea what the whole picture is like. So teach the things that are generally true and generally applicable, then you go into the, the specific areas that are going to be unique and distinct for each person. That'll make the teaching flow better. That'll make each person also feel cooler when you say, hey, here's all the rules. P.S. You get to break the rules this way. You get to do this really nifty thing. Uh, and so everybody then feels more empowered, which is what this episode's all about, right? 
So that's my teaching recommendation for this game. And like I said, there's tons of games that I'm sure that this would apply to. So leave in the comments below games that you think that this would be a great recommendation for. If you have more recommendations that you'd like me to cover, let me know. I'll be responding under the name Meeple Overboard. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed your stay at the Teacher's Lounge. And stay a friend of the blend. Birthdays. Christmas. Kickstarters. New releases. There's always something to look forward to. We're counting down! Hey! We're counting down! Hey! So fast is what they want you to believe But I keep looking at the clock just like a kid on Christmas Eve Just look at that calendar, days go by so slow There is so much to keep looking forward to, still many days to go The ladder seems to be too high, no way you're able to climb But baby steps will get you there, just go one day at a time So to help you cope, there's a calendar supply You count the days and open doors and cool stuff waits inside We're counting down, hey! Counting down, hey! No bags, riches some gifts, mysterium and champagne. New huts for cacao, glitch is never the same. A wishing wall for Clank, a mango village to build. An Easter bunny in the garden, snowman now have a guild. Another noble for splendor, Camera Station is mean. Horseshoes to play burgundy castles in D. in Alexandria, the kings will not be on. Hey guys, I'm Ben. And I'm Tommy. And we've been talking games. And today on Blender, we are looking at games that highlight uh, good role models that empower you. Uh, and we chose to look at firefighters. What is more empowering than firefighters? Nothing. Nothing. That's <laughs> what. <laughs> yes. And the game is Flashpoint Fire Rescue. Uh, in Flashpoint Fire Rescue, you're playing cooperatively with a group of up to six players. And you are a firefighter rushing into a burning building to save people. And occasionally dogs and cats. And occasionally nobody. And occasionally nobody. And occasionally uh, dead space. Hazardous materials. Hazardous materials, yes. But the game is fairly simple. It's an action point allowance game. You mm -hmm. have a certain number of actions that you can use per turn, and you will be working way around the table, being as efficient as possible, each turn with the fire raging on more and more, trying to destroy this building and trying to kill everyone inside. I act like the fire is a living... <laughs> it feels it's like making it choices. It is, yeah. It feels, it feels like, like it, it sometimes. Yes, yeah. sometimes. It's like, how did it specifically <laughs> go to the one spot we didn't need it to go to? Yes. Such as is, is co-ops, though. Yes, that's uh, very much the way it is. I, I, I like action point allowance games. I don't think there's enough of them. Off mm -hmm. hand, I can think of this in Takal. Um, but use it very straightforward, yeah. Like, as an action point. Like, you have this many... AP is what it's actually calling here. Yeah, don't use points. it, yeah. <laughs> Um, or don't use it unwisely. Anyway, um, and, and I, I, I like how it works here. I mm -hmm. especially like that you can save your action points from one round to another. Yeah, that's you. Um, and the theme is killer. Like, it Pretty comes through in yeah. this game. Like, chopping down walls and not, not letting the building fall down at the same time. And blowing doors off their hinges and yeah, stuff. So, yeah, so, so cool as far as, uh, theme goes. With the theme, though, comes a little bit of fiddliness. 
Agreed. Agree. Agreed. No. A couple so much. of rule structures that you have to go through with different firefighting terms, flashovers and hot spots, and there's a number of different terms like that. Yeah, a little I, bit confusing. It, yeah, it's it's a little, and it's still a co-op in my eyes. So you know, yep. automatic loss of points there for me. <laughs> I like saying, "Hey, I won against all of you." No, I'm just kidding. But <laughs> I. I, I it, uh, it is still a co-op, and it doesn't have any kind of, like, anti-alpha gamery. No, it, it falls very susceptible. There's no hidden information. It's no. It's, it's very all... prone to alpha gamer. That being said, it did meet my expectations. Right, okay. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I... That's a good thing, because typically with co-ops, they kind of fall off for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I didn't have very high expectations, <laughs> but... But I, they were met. Yeah, and and it did what it did well, and I, I enjoyed it. Okay, you might find this surprising. This is my game, and I will be keeping it in my collection. But this game is actually going to receive our first obsolete Woo! rating. What? Sell it, burn it, throw it into a burning building, no. <laughs> burn it down. <laughs> No, the reason being is I played this a while ago. My brother-in-law is a firefighter in Las Vegas. Not an excuse. And <laughs> I played it with him. Really enjoyed it, but this was early on in my gaming career, and I think that my uh, memory was a little clouded, because I was quite eager to get it after I uh, decided to give up my copy of Pandemic, and it, you know, it's good, like you said, but it wasn't what I remembered it being, and I'm going to keep it because it fills that niche that Pandemic has, Yeah, that very accessible... Uh, Cooler theme, in my opinion. Yeah. Does it better, also, in my opinion. Think? I think so. So, uh, for me, unfortunately, it is obsolete... But it's a great game. I'm it's apparently it. not. Don't even <laughs> approach this game. It's terrible. Nope. Avoid, Avoid it, it like the plague yeah. or a burning building. Yes. Call 911 if you see it. Get the fire department there. Burn it down. Flashpoint Fire Rescue. <laughs> see you guys next time. blend and welcome back to retro board game corner today we're talking about heroes now when i think of heroes one of the professions that come to mind is police officers well there was a police officer comedy show that ran from 1975 to 1982 i'm going to play the theme song for you see if you can get it Hey, did you get it? Well, here I have. It's Barney Miller, published in 1977 by Parker Brothers. This is a two to four player game in which the gang from the 12th Precinct is trying to catch wanted criminals. Let me set this up and show you how it works. So this is what the game board will look like set up. You're gonna set the red marker pawn here on the inner circle, and then every player is going to pick uh, one of the four characters. I'm gonna pick the fish here. So this is my desk, and these are the four crooks that I am responsible for capturing. Depending on how many players are playing, you'll get dealt evidence cards. Now these cards are just numbered one through 10. So every turn you will roll a six-sided dice and then move the red marker in a clockwise direction. I got a two, so I'm moving two. I landed on the cat burglars. So here the fish has on his wanted poster the cat burglars. So I would want to try to win this hand by playing my evidence cards. So starting with the first player, he will lay down a card. So I played a value of three card. So then the next player will lay down a card and he will announce the total of the two cards. If the total of the cards is under 10, then the next player would play a card. So now he's announcing that there is nine cards out there. 
So then the next player will play the card since it's below 10. And then the value right now is 10. So this player would go ahead and capture the cat burglars if he had it in his wanted posters here. So the winner of the round would be the player whose card makes the total exactly 10 or the last player whose card kept the total under 10 when the final total is more than 10. So after you figure out the winner of the round, everybody will put their cards in the discard pile and then the next player will roll the dice to see what space is next. So here we have to catch the fortune cookies. So here again I have a wanted poster for the fortune cookies so I would want to win this hand. There is also four special spaces on the board here that if you land on them they kind of uh, dictate on how that round of hand of cards is played. The first person to capture all four of their burglars on their wanted poster is the winner of the game. This is a must have for any fan of the show. Now, what I like about this game is that it's a simple trick-taking game, but when you land on these certain squares here, it dictates on how you play that round. That always makes it for some exciting combinations. Well, that's all the time I have for now. May your rolls be high. <clears throat> I don't think there are better role models in a board game than in, in Pandemic. Yeah, but to be perfectly honest, I had never even really thought about the characters in she's Pandemic. A, she's a first responder. I know. They're very stand up. But do they stand out? Exactly. There we go. No, they don't. Welcome to Bickering Over Board Games, where my wife and I discuss uh, trends in board games and how we feel about them. But the trend that I wanted to talk about mm -hmm. that I, I've seen occurring in, in board games is diversity in games. And both of these games um, are very much ahead of that curve. I mean, Dead or Winter is almost oh. comical. Especially once you get into The Long Night or right. Warring Colonies. I mean, you have... You have Hong Fen, the retiree, um, but you also have Kumar Sen, who's not only, you know, obviously of uh, non-European origin, um, he's but blind. he's blind but a public speaker, he's actually pretty great because he inspires people at the colony. It is a good... Yeah. I think that the Dead of Winter characters are better role models than the Pandemic characters because... Because they feel more real, even though sometimes it's, like, silly. Like, there's well, a pirate. They're more there's, flawed. This is Dead of Winter. This is Pandemic. These have more character, more personality. Right? They do. And I have done some bad things as a Dead of Winter character. I actually watched Sophie Robinson burn in her plane once. It's what the colony needed. And one thing that I think both of these games do really well is that they don't over-sexualize women, the female characters, aside from uh, the nurse over here. That's just a little bit of cleavage. And I think She's that, very damsel in distress. Yeah, something that we are seeing more of. I, I've noticed it in particular uh, with Kickstarter games. There's one I'm thinking of called Bargain Quest, which looks really funny because it's about selling items to adventurers. Mm -hmm. Tiny Epic Western, somebody in the Kickstarter comments pointed out that there were no, uh, that all the characters were white. But now there's an African-American bounty hunter in Tiny Epic Western because the creators listened to their backers, which is really cool. And I was just gonna say that in Fog of Love, you can play as Oh, same-sex couples. Uh -huh. That's so cool, yeah. yeah. As the hobby pushes forward and more people get included, they're going to, I mean, especially in the Kickstarter world, they can right. put well, the pressure. That's where I have to disagree with you, is that I think that, like, Kickstarter is definitely paid, you know, doing a better job than mm -hmm. board games in general, but I think board games in general are kind of behind. Like, they're, they're behind the curve on this. But these, neither of these are Kickstarter games. But these are the exceptions to the rule. I mean, these are both great games. And Wasteland wasn't. Well, that's true. Wasteland is actually pretty good in that regard as well. Yeah, and it's and also a, a great game, and we're going to review it soon. And that wasn't a Kickstarter. No, although it could have been. Yeah, but it wasn't. But the, my point being is that you still see plenty of Viking games with a bunch of you know, white Vikings, which brings up a whole other question, which is, if we're going to make yet another Viking game, 
do we make some of the Vikings non-white, which is sort of, that is sort of historically inaccurate. I mean, that's a whole other debate in on the forums. Yeah, and I think that that's something, well, I don't know, because I don't really like Viking games. We really sound like we hate Viking games. This is the second time we've talked about it. <laughs> Blood Rage is one of my favorite games. I'm just going to throw it out there. She doesn't like it, though. Well, it's just, I'm always going to opt, you know, to play as, like, Sophie Robinson before I want to play as a Viking. There's an all-female clan and Vikings in Blood Rage. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I played as them, and they probably look like... Da-da-da-da-da. They look good. <laughs> Stop it. Uh, I'm just saying the art by Adrian Smith is very good. Uh, well, I think that's all the time we've got <laughs> for today. Because we're always drinking coffee? Mm -hmm. Thunderbirds was not an intellectual property that I was familiar with before I played this game, and in fact, after I played the game and liked it so very much, I went ahead and found out more about the Thunderbirds and the characters in the show, saw, saw a little bit of, of the old TV show, and also saw and really was captivated by the new TV show, the revival that Amazon put out. I think that one's called Thunderbirds Are Go. And you can watch that again. You can, you can stream it from, from Amazon. And I like that very much. It retains a lot of the uh, original themes and, and feelings from the original TV show while, you know, looking better. And I, I find it uh, much more appealing to me, largely because, again, I did not grow up with the original. So the nostalgia factor is lost on me a little bit. But what isn't lost on me is, is the themes and what that nostalgia must, must feel like to someone who did grow up with it. I find the theme in this game, this setting of the Thunderbirds, to be on the one hand, yes, it's a little hokey, it's a little heavy-handed, it has this, you know, uh, Captain America, Superman sort of bend to do no wrong, truth, justice idea, yeah? Which is, again, kind of hokey, but also very charming, and it's, it's disarmingly without uh, cynicism. And I enjoy that very much. It's it's everything you get in this game is at face value the truth. Yeah. And uh I, I, I find that captivating, you know, in to in, in this kind of package. It's it's charming, it's it's uh it's engaging, and it certainly makes me feel empowered when you are all of the players around the table cooperating to help the world solve different crises. It feels good to show up to be part of an ensemble, which I find very charming and, and empowering, and uh, solve some problems. And you don't always do that. You are rolling dice, sometimes you fail. But you always try, and that feels good. This game definitely makes you feel like, not just, not the hero, but part of a heroic team, which I find is even more appealing than just being a singular hero. The game, uses a lot of artwork from the original TV show, which is certainly dated. The cards are gonna have screen caps from the original game, uh, from the original TV show, I'm sorry, and that took a little getting used to, to be honest, largely, again, because I wasn't familiar with it. But now that I'm familiar with the TV show and the characters, I find them to be uh, a little silly, but very, uh, again, I keep coming back to charm. It's very charming. Another thing that you are that is going to help you feel empowered if you don't read into this uh, sort of a, a idea of being part of the ensemble too much is simply the different machines that these characters are going to have, the different tools at their disposal, and they have some great looking stuff in this game. So you've got all of these, and you've got Lady Penelope here cruising around the UK, helping uh, everyone else coordinate, helping be part of the team. It's got a good feel to it, a, a, you know, let's do some good kind of vibe. I enjoy it very much. I think you check it out. It's a little bit quirky because of everything it brings to the table for me with the IP tying into a modern design, a, a pandemic-ish get-together somewhere and, and solve some issues. The game is logistically very interesting because it's tricky getting everyone to be in the right spot to make something happen in the game, it, it can be a tough game to win and do well in. So I find it to be a, a strange amalgamation of different concepts and ideas that 
perhaps wouldn't work for a lot of people. And I think that's partly why I consider it to be a quirky game. You know, you'd have to have a, certain, a bunch of different likes to like this. You have to like the TV show, or at least be receptive to it. You have to like the cooperative nature of the game. It's it, I could see it being um, not necessarily divisive, but easily dismissible. And that's a mistake, I think. I think you should look into it. If you enjoy co-op games at all, uh, if this is something that, even if you're not familiar with it, you think you could get into it and play that role of the good guy or gal, then I think you're gonna enjoy it. That is Thunderbirds. Check it out. Hi, I'm Max from Games and Families. Hi, I'm Tess. And hi, I'm George. And we have a magic dog. Yes. In his short life, our five-month-old silver toy poodle has eaten so many games pieces <laughs> that he's now able to tell which of two games is better. So George and Tess are now going to talk to him about two games, and we're going to, he's going to decide which is the better one in Gizmo Nose. Yay! <laughs> This is one of my favourite games, it's called Baron Park. It's where you're placing this kind of tiles on this kind of board. You can place them anywhere you want, and if you place it on each different thing, it does different activities or whatever you want to call it. So there are enclosures, there's polar bears, there's goby bears, there's panda bears, and there's koala bears, even though they're not technically bears, but people like koalas, so they put them in the game. You can also put in food stores for the customers, toilets, play parks and rivers and once you've filled up one of your tiles in any way possible you can put it wherever you like maybe I'll have that there maybe that there and once you finish filled it up but you cannot place on this pit then you can put that there and you get the points for that I'm finished <laughs> <laughs> so this is one of my oh, favorite for me this is one of my favourite games called Rhino Hero Super Battle, where basically there's this guy called Rhino Hero, and there's other characters too, uh, for Biggie, Giraffe Boy and Backwind, you can't really see that because it's so short, but um, basically what you're doing is you're building this tower of cards, like this, except it's a really cool tower, and you're trying to climb to the top, and when you get to the top, you get the superhero medal, like he's wearing, And if the tower collapses on anyone's go but yours, and you have a superhero medal, you win. And the other thing I like about this game is you, in the other game, you're climbing as one person. But in this game, you're climbing as different people. And if you go into the same level, you have a super battle, and the person who loses has to go down, which I think is quite fun. End. Ready? Yeah. Okay, so we're going to introduce the gizmo and see which of the games he chooses. Oh, oh, and it's a win for Baron Park! Congratulations to Tessie! Yay! Best of luck next time, George. <laughs> so, tune in next time. There will be a new challenger, two new games, but once again, gizmo will know. In this segment, I was requested to talk about good role models. And uh, my god, I already talked about Flashpoint. I went through my collection and I don't have much about good role models. I start wondering, what person am I? Am I bad? Why do I look for games that two pros and two cons for wanting to be the bad guy in a board game? First pro, as the bad guy, you usually have all the tools in your arsenal to go against uh, everyone, kill if you need to kill in your uh, one versus one battles or all versus all, and uh, being it Heroescape or Dice Masters being the superhero, killing all the bad guys, not feeling bad about uh, the killing part because ethics don't apply in the same way, obviously, in this entertainment. And so you go full speed in these battles without worrying about these things. Second pro, 
You can put hurdles for your opponents and not feel bad about it. You can stop their plans in Cold Express, for example, and uh, just feel good about it. So be the bad guy. There are cons for us, though. We, as bad guys, usually have a hard time winning in some games, in particular with Star Wars games. I have Imperial Assault and that's not easy to win as the bad guys, but even more so if you play Star Wars Risk. Oh my god, is it hard to win as the bad guy? I understand there were flaws in the Death Star, but did they need to translate those in the game as well? And the second and last con is this coming of cooperative experiences where there is always this traitor. And I hate being the traitor there. I hate being the bad guy in that experience because in that case, the rules of ethic come to hunt you. The good guys want you out of the game. And I played just recently two games in a row of uh, Dark Moon and I was both times the bad guy. Oh, I hated it. Because in that game, obviously, then you don't want them to know you're the bad guy. Otherwise, you're out, you're quarantined and your actions become crappy and the game is really not that fun anymore for you. And I was sweating all the time. It's not for me. Being the bad guy in cooperative, semi-cooperative experience is not for me. That's all. Have fun. Hey guys, I'm Shelby. And I'm Stephanie. The theme of this blender is games with good role models. So we picked a game that features one individual who is no longer with us today, but when I was a kid, he was always there for me, lifting up my spirits. It's the Bob Ross game. This game is a family weight set collection game Bob Ross would be proud of. So in honor of this game and Bob Ross, we are making a two-tier cake complete with an edible Bob Ross sculpture on the top. Let's get started. Here we go. We already baked our cakes. The flavors we are using today are chocolate and vanilla cake with cookies and cream buttercream. We're cutting our cakes in half and layering the cakes, alternating between the chocolate and vanilla and then we're filling them with buttercream frosting. If you'd like to see our recipes, you can find them on our website at sugarhighscore.com. Taste test, it's yummy. And then we repeated the same layering process for our smaller top tier cake. Onto the fondant. We rolled out the fondant, draped it over our rolling pin and placed it on top of the cake. We smoothed it out and removed the excess fondant. In this game, you get 15 double-sided painting panels. We think they're really beautiful, so that's what we're putting on our cake. Using food coloring gels, we painted fluffy clouds, happy little trees, wondrous waters, and almighty mountains. We aren't actually artists, but we did watch a few episodes of Bob Ross's show right before painting these, and he thought we could do it. Our first two paintings. We did it! And then we continued painting our smaller cake in the same way. Let's put it all together. We stacked our smaller cake on top of the larger cake and began attaching our paintings. Using royal icing, we piped more details along the edges of the cake and painted them with edible silver paint. I actually barely remember Bob Ross because I'm kind of young. What? You're like... Our cake wouldn't be complete without an edible Bob Ross sculpture. We're finished! Hooray! I think Bob Ross would be proud of us. Thank you for watching. We hope you enjoyed our segment. If you like baking like we do, be sure to check out our own YouTube channel. We're also on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. See you next time. Bye! Do you want to eat it? Yes. Okay. Mm. Marvel. D C. Marvel. D C. Marvel. D C. Whatever. Fine. Hello everybody and welcome to the life of a war gamer. Today we are going to talk about Justice League, Dawn of Heroes. 
and first of all you get uh, some tutorial rule books in this game and you get general rule books so you know how to play with all heroes and then you get the mission book so you can play different mission in this game uh, all that you will be playing on these uh, modular boards that can be arranged uh, as the mission requires so they are two-sided with all kinds of different uh, markings and uh, different type of terrains and whatnot uh, what else we have here is a bunch of tokens we have like tons and tons of different tokens i mean there's like these cheats and then there's tokens for these heroes and uh, some uh, extra sidekick villains and good guys and all oh, bunch of stuff health tokens uh, stat status tokens uh, all bunch of tokens really uh, the next thing we have in this game is uh, these cards that represent your heroes you have batman hero you have aquaman green lantern wonder woman superman flash and also you have some bad guys like uh, dark side Doomsday, Joker, Lex Luthor, for example. Uh, also, you get some sidekicks. These are smaller cards. There is Shazam here, Power Girl, Nightwing, there's Cyborg. There are also bad guys like Harley Quinn, Captain Cold, Black Manta. As you can see, there's a bunch of evil generic henchmen also in here. And we have some cards in this game. In this game, uh, some heroes are driven by card play, some are driven by tokens you get and you get to spend them on the abilities and others are just, uh, you use them with uh, dice. You play dice and uh, you activate their abilities. Uh, uh, it, it depends what you roll and whatnot. So there's basically lots of cards with different abilities, like for example, uh, we have these Batman cards and you draw these cards and you, then you get to play shoulder throw and whatnot. So there's all kinds of different stuff. But the best thing in this game are miniatures. Miniatures are really cool. They are a bit smallish, so I'll have to try and put it closer. So basically you have Aquaman, you have Wonder Woman, there's Flash also. Then you have Green Lantern. And let me just put these away. And you have all course Batman and Superman but you have to pair them against some enemies so what you get is Lex Luthor miniature you also get uh, this one is called dark side yes yes dark side and this one is Joker and then you have doomsday a really big guy I mean check this out it's like crazy how he's bigger than this guy and that's everything that comes in a box of Justice League, Dawn of Heroes. Cool shirt. Until next time. All right, everybody, that's going to do it for us on this episode. I hope you had fun. I want to say a big thanks to all my contributors, of course. If you want to be a contributor to Board Game Blunder, well, you send me an email and let's chat about it. You got a great idea for a new segment? Let me know. And you could be on Board Game Blender. All right. Again, big thanks to you, the viewers, for checking us out, and I'll see you again in a couple of weeks. As always, hey, stay a friend of the blend. I'll see you next time.